Coming up, for the first time, an Osage man gets the nod for an Oscar nomination for Best Original Song. The Ho-Chunk Nation and Discover Wisconsin bring you snakes, snow snakes that is, plus the live action series of Avatar The Last Airbender and the indigenous voices and culture you'll see on TV. Join us for those interviews, plus headlines on the ICT Newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Support for the ICT Newscast with Aliyah Chavez comes from the Arizona PBS studios in Phoenix at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications at Arizona State University. Thank you for joining us. I am Aliyah Chavez. In the world of sports, the family of a nine-year-old Kansas City Chiefs fan is suing a sports news publication. The Armenta family filed a defamation lawsuit against Deadspin, accusing the company of using a photo of their son wearing a feather headdress and red and black face paint at a game out of context in an article. The Armenta family said they urged Deadspin to correct the article, noting that the child and his father are citizens of the Santa Inez Band of Shoe Mash Indians. The story's headline initially said the NFL needs to speak out against the Kansas City Chiefs fan and blackface native headdress. Deadspin made several tweaks to the story, but it was only until the family wrote a letter demanding a retraction that they removed any direct references to the child. Well, Portland State University wants to be a target destination for Indigenous STEM students. PSU is one of 10 institutions selected to participate in the Sloan Center's For Change initiative. Over the next two years, PSU will use a $250,000 grant to invest in Indigenous Black and Latino doctoral students. Joseph Bull, the only Native American to serve as a dean of an engineering school in the U.S., says this is the right time to make PSU a destination for Native STEM. According to PSU data, only 1.1% of graduate students identified as Native American or Alaska Native. Do you love a parade? The city of Scottsdale put together its annual Parada del Sol February 3rd. Along with horses, antique cars, and floats, many tribes and tribal royalty marched through the streets. Performances that were showcased included ram dancers, bareback riders, and all well Miss White Mountain waved to the crowd. According to Parada del Sol's website, the event attracts around 30,000 people a year. The fun didn't stop at the end of the parade. Many continued by going to the surrounding bars and restaurants in Old Town and experiencing the trails and festival. Netflix's live-action adaptation of Avatar The Last Airbender releases later this month, and it includes native actors and culture. ICT's Mackenzie Allen Charmley breaks down the series and it in its indigenous representation on an elemental level. Water, earth, fire, air, and native culture. The Avatar The Last Airbender live action will increase indigenous representation on TV on a widespread scale. The new Netflix series stars Mohawk actress Gyoen Fio Tarbo as Katara and will depict Aang and Team Avatar's journey through the southern and northern water tribes among other nations. Casted at the age of 14, Tarbo moved far from her home of Akwesasne to film, jumping at the opportunity to portray Katara. Growing up as a little native girl, you know, in Akwesasne, um, I never thought that this was a position that I'd ever get to be in. And that was one of the reasons that I loved the show so much growing up, you know, there wasn't many shows or characters that I could see myself in. And um, to see Katara, and especially for her to be so strong and vocal and just, just a warrior. The Northern and Southern Water Tribes have been attributed to being inspired by Inuit cultures. Fans of the popular animation series say it's one of the only series to portray Arctic Indigenous ways of life in mainstream media. 
For Tarbell, contributing to Indigenous representation on this level is a blessing. To see my little brown girl self in that type of character was just so empowering and um, just so important to have that for for young kids. And and I am feel super blessed to be able to be that for other little ind Indigenous girls, you know. Tarbo feels her role is paving the way for more space for Native culture and representation on television. We are capable of anything, and I hope that seeing it on a scale, on a show with this scale, will be eye-opening for my people. And like, you can truly do anything, you know. And it's it's all up to you, and it's all up to how you think. For ICT News, Mackenzie Allen Charmley. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. An Oscar nomination goes to an Osage man for the original song composed for Killers of the Flower Moon. Scott George wrote and performed Wajaje, a song for my people. ICT's Sandra Schulman and Shirley Snavy asked him how the song came about. We had talked about our music and reviewed it. We have several that uh, probably could have delivered the same impact, um, but they had uh, people's names in them, you know, that were uh, from two or 300 years old. And there are still people that uh, uh, today that uh, refer back to those as their relatives. So uh, they weren't appropriate, of course, for that, for that purpose. And so we finally come to the conclusion of, uh, that we're going to have to compose our own. And um, myself and, and uh, my uh, brother and lifelong friend, Van Big Horse, and uh, even Kenny Big Horse, his brother, we, uh, we started about the process of trying to do so. And uh, in doing so, uh, traditionally, if you're going to compose a song, um, we usually go to a prayer uh, in order to get it started and ask for help. And then, uh, you know, we, our belief is that even, even the music that we sing over and over and over is just a gift uh, from God and it didn't really come from us, you know. Uh, so we, we go that, we do that first and then we start the process of trying to uh, figure out what we're going to say in the, in the, in the, in the song, uh, what words we want to use. And we've kind of found that, uh, or I have, that once you once you put the words that you want in there and start uh, uh, singing a little bit, they, they kind of find their own way in into the song. And uh, I don't know how that works uh, in regards, and that's probably why they say it's 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 God's way. Uh, is that uh, our song, our words have a natural rhythm to it, and it, they just happen to fit into that rhythm of, the, of that type of music. Pretty much wake up every morning with a, a song in your in your mind as, as, as long as we've been singing and so uh, when this process started i'll be like hey where'd that come from and i I'd listen i'd sing it to myself and you know it might take me a while to get it right and then if i got it right i'm like oh yeah okay that's that's from, from when i was about 18 somebody sang that and that was kind of popular back then so it took a little while about a few months before we we finally uh came up with something and then, and then my uh, brother van big horse who's he's we we're all three consultants on this uh, on this project um and he composed a song also so he was we were both working at the same time trying to do this there's probably not an understanding uh outside of us uh, singers what the parts are to the song you know and, and actually how long they last or or what it takes to get to get to what they wanted to, to see. Uh, they wanted that energy that, that they saw in our dances. Uh, Martin and I think Leo and, and uh, Lily were all attended our ceremonial dances. And so they, they saw that, saw that energy that we were uh, uh, involved in, but it's, it's not one that you could just sing one song and get there. You know, you kind of build up to it over a course of four or five songs. And then, uh, uh, then you throw one in there that you know that uh, captures that energy. So that's kind of what they were looking for. 
And then uh, uh, what we were trying to do was capture it right off the very at the very beginning. And so that we knew we had to have something that had a lot of energy in it to get started. There was also some uh, a discussion I had the other day. Uh, what's the difference between uh, contemporary and traditional music? And so there is, that's that's where we lean is is for traditional music and uh, contemporary music. We kind of liken that to what's sung at powwows. Like like for this song in particular, when this is all over with, we want to use this song, you know, uh, as an honor song uh, in case somebody's. Uh, called to be a head man or head lady, they can use a song if they don't have a family song to use. The uh, in the there's two parts of the song. There's the the lead part of it, and then there's three what we refer to as honor beats in the middle, and then there comes the tail of the song. And in the tail of the song is where the words are, and we're uh, the uh, first part is wajaje nonje tida be. And, and so we're asking, uh, I'm asking, since I made the song, I'm asking my people to, to stand up. And then uh, Wakanda Gakabe is, is, uh, means that God made it for us. And so when you, when, when you just translate it literally, that's, it's that simple. That's all it says. Um, when you ask me what I meant by it, I meant that um, uh, everything that our people have gone through especially the what's depicted in the movie, but even today, we still go through issues and, and situations that uh, uh, politically and, and uh, uh, some, some horrific situations that are still out there. Um, you know, the, I guess the, uh, when you talk about the uh, missing Indian women and, and things of that nature, so we're still going through those things. And so I'm, I'm saying that uh, I want my people to stand up, be proud, because God got you this far. We're so appreciative of being gotten this far, you know. Uh, it's, it's not something we aspire to, to do. It's just we just want to contribute to the movie and, and, and show our people that we care about them, that we, we love our people, and that's, that's uh, where we were coming from. And, and so when this came about, it was like, we don't, we're speechless. We don't know really what to, what to, how to talk about it, but it's a, uh, it's a, it's quite an honor. Growing up, I've always wanted to help people. I remember stories of my mom telling me, uh, walking down the aisle at the uh, grocery store and uh, just asking people, how are you doing today? Uh, as a nurse, we're taught to lay hands, and that, that's so much healing. A lot of people don't get that loving touch. And, uh, you know, as a nurse, going back to the res reservation, I think, man, like, how much impact can you make just loving people right? I think for a long time, Na the Native American people have been fed this lie of you're dependent upon, say, the government. But I would love to create a culture where it's, it's the Native American that says, I'm doing this so that I can make my community better. I'm doing this so that I could bring commerce into my community. I'm doing this so that I can have the resources to help others. Ho-Chunk families get inventive when it comes to staying warm in the winter. One game has been passed down through the generations, which is snow snakes. Our partners at Discover Wisconsin have more. This may go as far back as in the last glacier period, uh, where the snow snake or the spear process was used to harvest animals even way back then. Everybody who wants to play the snow snake, you know, they all gather up and, and they stand in line there and we take turns. And the person who throws that snow snake the longest down that track, they are the winner. There's no seconds, there's no thirds, because there's no seconds and thirds out there in real life if you're out there trying to bring back game, for example, for your family to eat. You don't get a second throw. Not to be saddened about the loss and then not to be too braggart about the winning. Snow Snake is there to enjoy together. Uh, 
the Ho Chunk um, has always been known as um, a very strong, vibrant group of people. Our communities uh, remain strong, even though there had been concerted efforts to remove us from this area, uh, concerted efforts to um, remove us of our culture, you know, and our ways of life. And yet, by staying together as a tight-knit community over here, uh, we support each other. These games play an important role even for us, you know, to assure that our children realize that, you know, this is uh, something that we can lay claim to here ancestrally. The process actually, you know, comes from the ancient form of using spears and such in chase of prey. You get a, you know, herd of deer just sitting in a, a waist deep of snow there. Uh, well, a snow snake works perfectly for us, you know, sending that spear along the edge of the snow there and harvesting, you know, an animal in mid winter. Um, some have mentioned that this may go as far back as in the last glacier period, uh, where the snow snake or the spear process was used to harvest animals even way back then. So what you want to do is go select the wood, make sure it's fairly straight grained. Uh, and then uh, begin to render it down into a shape where there is some form of head on that snake. What is as important as the shape of it is also sometimes what you place upon it for your own personal effects. Uh, you'll see a variety of our snow snakes, for example, will have, uh, whether there's applique on it or a snow snake face or something that you hold near and dear to your heart, your own initials, for example, so you don't lose it in the monks of snow snakes. And then you begin to try to make sure that the bottom half, for example, is as smooth as it can be. And then the key to a good running snow snake is, in fact, is how you uh, protect and preserve it, whether you use uh, uh, some type of linwood seed or something that repels water. Um, but that final layer is where you want to really assure that you have a, either a nice clear varnish on it or that you pick your secret wax, right, that, that you place on the bottom of its hole that it runs officially across the snake. We have been stripped of, from a lot of our culture and, and placed as people that are scattered about amongst their own ancestral areas. And that assimilation uh, still plays heavily upon us today. You know, in 2015, uh, we decided to reincorporate the snow snake back into the tribal communities for the Ho-Chunk and realized that it was a really fun, enjoyable opportunity for us to get together as communities. You know, our youth were able to come out there and stand right alongside their parents and their grandparents and just enjoy something to break that long period of winter that we experienced in Wisconsin. Here we had this eight-year-old throw it 110 feet and he actually won. And 110 feet, you know, I can't even throw a softball 110 feet anymore at my age there too, but it's nice to see these youth, you know, taking advantage of something and experiencing something new that they may not experience anywhere else. It was kind of nice to uh, see my daughter, um, uh, my youngest daughter at that, uh, to see her come down there on her own free will, for example, to, you know, come down there and enjoy, you know, the outdoors, you know, this is what parents live for. You know, we weren't just sitting in our chipotecas or our lodges throughout the winter doing nothing at all. We enjoyed all four seasons just as much, if not more, than the peoples around us. That we were a lively, very invigorous people out there. And we didn't survive. We excelled in living in this region. We've did it for thousands of years in this area, and we're continuing to do it for the next thousand years where it holds up. Language revitalization is a priority for many tribes across Turtle Island. It's what ties them to their sense of place and identity. Almost 10 million people identify as American Indian or Alaska Native, but only a quarter of a million speak their indigenous language. ICT wants to do its part in raising awareness about the beauty of these native languages. That's why ICT has added a regular feature to our newscast. Today, let's hear the Passamaquoddy language from the Wabanaki Nation. Wooly one. Wooly one. Thank you. Wooly is good. So Wooly one is thank you in a good way.
Indigenous arts across the world start with resources. The Hawaiian art of making kapa, which is cloth made from tree bark, is no different. Miley Andrade works with kapa from the ground up. Shirley Snavy has the story. It starts with the bark of the paper mulberry tree. Hawaiians call it wake. With a shift grant from the Native Arts and Culture Foundation, Miley Andrade is partnering with a nature preserve to grow it for kapa making. Holulu Aina is in the island. So I live in um, Kauai, which is an outer island. And so my practice here with the grant, we're doing the same thing that Holulu Aina is going to be doing, but the one in Kauai is going to be smaller and more private. The one in Holulu Aina will be open to the public because Honolulu is its base and um, access to more people. And it's tucked back in the valley, Kalihi Valley. And, you know, you could be in the city like in 10 minutes, but then when you go back into the valley, you're like in the country. And Holulu Aina is run by Puni Jackson, who was one of my students at the university, who is now has an MFA in painting and drawing, but now runs this beautiful community center. I found the challenging part of practicing our culture is resources. And lots of people wanted to learn the skill, but before you can even get the skill, you need to have stuff to work from. And, um, and, and most of the things that we use in our culture to do practice our skill is it, isn't something you just go to a store and buy. So you have to grow it. You have to harvest it. And I'm trying to discourage, um, my students from just going into the forest and just taking, you know, if you're a beginner, that's not probably the best practice. I think you should practice first and become more, um, prof you know, proficient in what you're doing before you can go to the forest. Hopefully we want to be able to create a group on all the islands that we can just practice. And I'm not practicing kapa in a sense where I want to, um, bring it back as an art form. We really want to practice and make pieces for ceremony. You know, there's a lot of artists just making pieces to sell and make money, which it's not a bad thing because you got to make a living at it. But for me, I feel that it's not a priority to do that. I think the priority is to be able to make pieces that can serve our community, our Hawaiian community in burials or in clothing for ceremony or for births or weddings, you know, the way traditionally these pieces were used. The, the extension of the traditional or traditional is a tricky word or customary practices of kapa, you know, today, what is, how do we take it into the future? And so it would be paper making, print making, books, you know, and how do we continue telling the stories for our younger students, you know, for the for the next generation or the generation after. And that's sort of what I'm interested in. You know, how do we how do we not lose the Ike or the knowledge of our ancestors? Shirley Snavy, ICT News. When I think about the reservation and my life there as a kid. It's a time and a place that I really yearn for because I spent that time with really formative people in my life teaching me what it meant to be Navajo. As Native Americans, substantial rights under the Constitution and laws of this country were going unenforced. Those traumas show up in our elders throughout our lives, throughout our parents' lives. A lot of the history is still impacting us to this day. There's something really powerful that happens when you articulate an injustice. And at NARF, we do that on all fronts. The Native American Rights Fund is the oldest and largest nonprofit law firm. Fighting alongside our tribal communities to defend Native American rights. I see the difference that it makes with our Indian people. We are facing really challenging times. The right to vote has been under siege. Without voting, every other right in Indian country that matters falls. So it's really important to have NARF standing with our tribal people to define voting as part of the fight for tribal sovereignty. Anytime Native American voters are in a position to swing elections, that's when you see the most egregious violations of their voting rights. And so we responded to that moment. 
The Native American Voting Rights Practice Group arose with this rising anti-democratic movement that has been happening across America. The voting rights litigation that we do is tough. The facts are tough. They're very personal to our voting team, but our wins are big. And we win all the time. We have to be vigilant in terms of protecting our rights, just like we have these last 53 years. In order to make good on the promise of America, we have to make sure that every Native American can vote and have the ability to effectuate change in their communities. I think that's the way that we collectively move forward. The Native vote matters because it's important, because it makes change in all of the states we work in. When our ballot box achieves justice for Native people, that's when we as a country can really feel faith in our institutions. This election year, NARF will be leading the fight to protect Native American voting rights in states across the country. Follow along as we tell our stories from reservations, communities, and on the front lines of democracy. Now is the moment. Join us. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.